It appears as though the Houthi rebels want more weapons from Iran to continue with their attacks in the Red Sea. Now, to chat about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftario, joins us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, according to U.S. intelligence officials, the Houthis are planning for even more attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea? Yeah, but why not, right? When they have been chest thumping and flexing their muscles and there have, has not been a true way to deter them um, from the get-go, right, in terms of policy, in terms of the stance of the West, the White House not being able to stand in the way of Iran's regime, who is pu pulling the puppet strings, of course, they're going to go back to uh, their supplier and say, we need more. We're, we're doing such a great job we need you to give us more weapons to do what we're doing. And in terms of, of being you know, that intimidator in that region, they're doing a wonderful job because we know the carrier ships are staying out of the way. It's affecting the global economy. It's, it's affecting global import-export. Uh, and, and of course, that's exactly what Iran's regime wants to see. They want to see that they are making a difference, that they are the ones who are being the disruptors on the global stage. And again, there has not been a true way to stop them. Now, U.S. Navy ships are trying to do their part in the Red Sea, uh, protecting a lot of these merchant vessels, Lisa. There are reports that U.S. fighter jets have been destroying some of the Houthi missile launchers that were preparing to fire on some of the merchant ships. Yeah, and thank goodness that we do have that presence there. I will uh, give that to the Biden administration. The fact that we do have that presence there, I think, uh, basically de-escalated a lot more than what would have happened. For example, we didn't see uh, Hezbollah's true uh, involvement um, in, in the war uh, against Israel, although they have been firing missiles into northern Israel since October 7th. We haven't seen them get involved in a more meaningful way that would um, have two very heated fronts for Israel uh, to defend against. Uh, in the same way, we're seeing, you know, um, an involvement by, you know, proxies all over the region. But uh, it's it's whack-a-ball for the United States to be able to control all these different provocations. And truly, the, the bottom line is, that is Iran's regime really just sticking it to the United States over and over again. And if the United States tries to separate these two conflicts, meaning calling the war against Israel one thing and then say, seeing these provocations as one-offs by Iran's regime and their proxies, that is absolutely false. It's going to set us back in terms of really acknowledging that, it, that this is all coming because of our policy uh, with regards to Iran's regime, because we removed vital sanctions, because we gave them billions of dollars, because we allowed their centrifuges to spin. Uh, this is why we are at where we're at. And until the White House decides that they actually want to do an about face on their Iran policy, we're not going to see any changes and we're going to continue to see these escalations, the provocations, and um, of course, the whack-a-mole that the White House has to play in, in terms of, of deterrence. A number of world leaders, including Justin Trudeau here in Canada, want to see a two-state solution, you know, when it comes to Gaza, Israel, Palestine. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu, Israeli's prime minister, says, fat chance, we're going to wipe out Hamas. There's not going to be a two-state solution. But from your contacts and your sources, what are you hearing right now? You know, it is absolutely tone deaf to talk about a two-state solution right now. Many of, of those who are for a two-state solution, meaning in the, in the future, in the long run, of course, these two people have to live side by side, and we hope that they can find a way to coexist. But October 7th ruined any chance right now of there being a two-state solution as the status quo stands, meaning when you have an existential threat three or four city blocks away from your borders, when you know that they do not, not in fact, they, they, not that they just don't want to coexist. They want you off the map. They want every Jew dead, whether they live in Toronto or New York or L.A. or Israel. Um, that is not a peaceful partner. That is not the starting point. And to talk about it now, when Israel is still involved in rooting out Hamas because their tunnels are 300 feet underground, because they are 400 miles long, it just shows you that this is not a neighbor that wants to live side by side. This is a neighbor that has used every resource it has to build an infrastructure of war and terrorism against its neighbor. And when they say from the river to the sea, that is not tongue in cheek. They actually want to wipe out Israel from the river to the sea, meaning genocide, meaning to get rid of them. And until we hear, you know, a, when we see leadership from the Palestinians that actually wants to live side by side, when you see this, this rhetoric in this generation, want to have peace with Israel, then you will see policies that reflect 
that change in their neighbor. Um, we're just not seeing that. And again, for the United States to push that two-state solution now and to expect the Israelis. One other thing that I really want to point out here is that people talk about the left and right in Israel. Many of those who are taken hostage and most of those who were killed are actually on Israel's left, meaning they were for a two-state solution, meaning they were against uh, Bibi Netanyahu, meaning they were for peace. But right now, when you go to Israel, the sentiment is very different. Of course, if when there's an existential threat, when they're raping their daughters and killing their children and taking them hostage and truly brutalizing them in the most inhumane way we've ever seen, well, it, it's, it, again, the wrong time to talk about the two-state solution and the wrong time to talk about living side by side. Where are we at when it comes to the release of more hostages, Lisa? Last report, there were still over 100 that were being held by the terrorist group Hamas. Right. And it's, it, again, um, still being held 107 days. I think we're into the war right now. Um, you know, again, it's it's crazy to think the world is calling for either two state solution, ceasefire, ceasefire, ceasefire. But we don't hear much about calling for the release of those hostages, innocent civilians who really have nothing to do with this discussion of two state solution or peace or coexistence or living side by side. Those are citizens, a lot of women and children among them. We don't even know if they're alive or what condition they're in. Um, I, I have interviewed the family of one of those, the, the eldest um, of the hostages who is 85 years old, who has been without his medication um, and is still being held. So, I mean, what does this have to do with peace or policy or land when you're holding innocent civilians? And that is really what the U.N., the United States, Canada, anyone who is involved in this conversation should be pushing for right now is a release of those civilians first and foremost. And then we can have a conversation about whatever else. Now, here's another scary story. The director of the World Health Organization is calling on countries to prepare for another pandemic, Lisa, or disease X, which is a placeholder for an unknown pathogen that could cause a global emergency. Let's talk a bit about that. Yeah, <laughs> pretty depressing, right, Al? Because we know as we climbed out of our pandemic, uh, we realized what the world, the World Health Organization, the CDC, were not being forthright about a lot of the, the intel, a lot of where this originated, um, if the masks actually worked, if the vaccines actually worked, what the side effects of the vaccines were. And anyone who questioned this, I'm not saying it negated it, but questioned this, was silenced. And now they're asking the world to sign on to a treaty for X, meaning just a placeholder, just a placeholder. What do we know about X? I mean, what do they know about X is really the question that we should be asking here. And um, side by side, this this week, the Foreign Desk reported on a new strain, a new virus that has been tested on mice in China that absolutely kills. It has a 100 percent fatality rate. Why are what's going on here? What is how did this begin? Where did this virus come from? Why are they testing it? Are the U.S. is the U.S. funding these labs that are testing it? And again, what what we should question the timing of all of this testing being done in China with 100 percent fatality rate side by side, the, the WHO uh, preparing for a virus that is just called X, a placeholder virus. And they want the rest of us to just stand by and sign on to another pandemic that will shut down the world. Here's an idea. How about we shut down the labs? That'd probably be a better start. Great. I, I'm with you, Hal. I'll sign on to that. Lisa, six nuns have been kidnapped in Haiti as the island nation continues to suffer from uncontrollable gang violence right now. The Catholic bishop of Port-au-Prince said the nuns were taken from the diocese on Friday while traveling on a bus while traveling on a bus. So much gang violence there. Uh, we know the U.S. has has um, issued uh, travel warnings, has pulled a lot of its vital uh, staff there as well because of the gang violence, has not been able to control it. Um, we know uh, many world powers have decided to send help over there to try to control that gang violence. And now we see the victims of all of this, six innocent nuns that were traveling on a bus uh, and we pray for their their, their quick release. Uh, I don't know what the gangs would want from six nuns other than to send a clear message that they are in power and they will wreak havoc on the most innocent elements of society, and in this case, these nuns. A group of Jewish students in Washington, D.C. have filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against American University for not doing very much after the school was vandalized with swastikas and pro-Nazi propaganda? Yes, yeah, so it looks like this is the new way forward. A lot of uh, groups, committees, and individuals taking matters into their own hands to bring lawsuits against universities that are not protecting Jewish 
students. Now, uh, Jews are not protected under the DEI, uh, the uh, discrimination um, uh, kind of uh, umbrella, because they're not a protected class. They're actually seen as um, the instigators or, you know, the. It, it's crazy that we are punishing victims here. Um, in the United States, the Jews make up 2.4 percent of the population, but they make up more than 60 percent of hate crimes right now. And that number is probably much more heightened um, on, on college campuses where students are going to faculty and administration and reporting these cases, but are being turned away or ignored or, you know, the, these files are, are falling on the wayside where in, disproportionately when other groups are going and complaining about them, something is done. And we all saw this with the uh, suits that were brought, or the, I should say, the testimonies um, of the uh, Ivy Leagues, UPenn, Harvard, et cetera, where certain individuals were re removed from campus because they were not able to acknowledge the problem of anti-Semitism. But has the problem been fixed? Has the system been fixed where uh, th there is no acknowledgement of hate crimes against Jews and anti-Semitism? So perhaps uh, the pulling of funding by Jewish donors, perhaps the students protesting uh, in ways that they can bring litigation, because we know that um, you know the, the other students happen to be louder on campus. These pro-Hamas uh, protests continue on every single day. Uh, Jewish students are hiding in libraries and in dormitories because of uh, this pressure, this uh, violence, et cetera. So hopefully these cases will shine a light on the um, the prevalence and um, will fix the, the issues across the board. Convicted killers in Washington state may soon be able to vote. Now there's a bill before the House by Democrat Tara Simmons who wants to restore the rights of felons. You know, we're coming up on an election, Hal, so we're going to see a lot of interesting um, both formal and informal ways to skew our um, voting process. And here is a way to allow felons um, to participate, to be involved. Uh, we've obviously seen a big push to get um, illegal immigrants um, involved and allow them to vote without any sort of ID, um, get, get health insurance, et cetera. So there's a lot going on here in terms of, of skewing uh, the system to bring in more voters, but we shall see. This is going to be an interesting year ahead. Let's talk about Ron DeSantis walking away, Lisa. It appears to be a two-horse race now for the GOP between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. Yes, yeah, so as we move towards New Hampshire, um, coming up in a, just a, some, some hours away, um, it's going to be interesting to see uh, who takes this. Of course, Donald Trump has the lead there, but Nikki Haley has been gaining. She got a few important uh, endorsements in the state of New Hampshire. But in the meantime, everyone was surprised to see Ron DeSantis drop out of the race over the weekend. Going into the, the uh, campaign season, everyone thought Ron DeSantis had a wonderful chance because of the sweeping victory he had in Florida, because of all the wonderful things he had done in Florida, and because he was almost like a young Donald Trump, uh, non-establishment, came out of nowhere and did so much good for the state of Florida, uh, has a lot of popularity there. Um, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to bring the same charisma to the primaries and um, was beat out by Nikki Haley. Um, so now we're watching to see who will take this between Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. As, of course, on his way out, Ron DeSantis did give his support to Donald Trump and called Nikki Haley uh, an establishment um, politician who was involved with corporations and such, uh, and um, very surprising to see Ron DeSantis, who has been fighting uh, publicly against Donald Trump, give his endorsement to Donald Trump on his way out. So we shall see what will happen. This will be an interesting week and a very important primary in New Hampshire. Well, let's talk about the fundamental differences as you see them between Nikki Haley and Donald Trump. You know, I think over the last, Nikki Haley has done such wonderful work. Of course, she's a woman. She brings in a lot of female voters, mothers, and those who are just tired of the Biden administration and want something different. So she will bring in a certain segment of independent and left of, of center voters. Uh, Donald Trump, on the other hand, has his own audience, MAGA, MAGA, MAGA world. Um, they have stayed very, very uh, true and loyal to him. Um, and those voters perhaps might see Nikki Haley as part of the establishment. She did um, turn on Donald Trump, so to speak, a couple of times, even though she worked in his administration. So a lot of people see, see that as a condemnation of her. Um, Donald Trump, of course, has a lot of legal issues right now. It's, uh, you know, of course, a lot of people find him to be divisive, even though they like him. They don't want to bring about that kind of infighting into the country. So they think, you know, Nikki Haley will give us a new 
fresh start. Um, I also see a lot of voters who are Democrats give Nikki Haley money um, because they find her to be, again, a, a female. Uh, she's a first generation um, success story. She um, comes from um, immigrant roots. Uh, she's done a lot of, of good work at the UN and um, in her, her home state. Um, so we shall see. I think both of them has, have a lot of pros and cons going. And who knows? The rumors floating say that he might just pick her to be VP and they can run on the same ticket. Let's see if she will allow it or if he will even offer it. So we shall see. Yeah, let's see how it plays out. Definitely. Political reporter and foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for joining us once again from Los Angeles. My pleasure.